Um, it's now my great honor to introduce today's second speaker, Dr. Steve Bertowski. Uh, so Steve, following his undergraduate undergraduate degree from Princeton, joined the lab of Phil Sharp at MIT for his PhD, during the course of which he published numerous foundational studies on PIC formation and transcription initiation, many of which I was taught in my undergrad courses. Uh, following his PhD, Dr. Bertowski became a Whitehead Fellow before joining Harvard Medical School as an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology. Um, as an independent scientist, Dr. Bertowski has made numerous found out fundamental contributions to our understandings of transcription initiation and elongation um, on uh, many different topics within that, that scope. Um, and his recent work using single molecule imaging to study transcription is revealing fascinating new insights into these processes. Um, all that to say, I'm very excited for his talk today. So please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual welcome to today's second speaker, Dr. Steve Bertowski. Thanks, Ben. Um... You guys can see my slide, okay? Yes. Good. Okay, so um, as Ben mentioned, I wanna tell you today about a new direction we've taken in the last few years, um, using single molecule microscopy to ask some questions about transcription. And the question I wanna address today, I won't answer it, is you know how is, do transcription activators actually increase transcription? And if you open up a textbook or review, you'll see the standard answer. You'll say, well, activators recruit things like coactivators, chromatin remodelers, or TF2D or mediator RNA polymerase. But I want you to step back and think, you know, what does recruit mean? Do you really know what that means? I certainly don't necessarily. Um, if you look and think about it, that can mean several things. I mean, recruit usually, I think many of us think of it as the activator somehow reaches out and grabs the target factor and, and brings it to the promoter in some manner. And if you think about it in terms of kinetics, that means enhancing the, the association rate. But if you look at the bacterial literature and how bacteria um, do gene regulation, um, true activators work in a different way. They actually um, will interact with the, um, the DNA independently. So generally they're sequence specific DNA binding factors. Um, the polymerase holoenzyme by itself can also interact. And the way you get an increase in transcription is by stabilizing um, through a cooperative interaction. And that effect is primarily uh, an off rate effect. And of course, in the case of eukaryotes, we can think about indirect models. Certainly, you could imagine the activator somehow allosterically changing the conformation of the target factor, or um, very likely, this is true, just removing nucleosomes from the promoter makes it accessible. And that might be a way that you could at least indirectly recruit a factor. Um, I just took a sample of some, some figures from recent reviews, and this is usually what we show when we talk about what activated transcription looks like. But I, I mean, these, these models are a first approximation, but of course we really can't be satisfied with it. They're very static, first of all. And um, you'll, what you'll generally see is um, activators and enhancer, the polymerase is sitting at the promoter. These things are stably interacting through some kind of looping. Um, sometimes that includes cohesins holding them together. And then on top of that, you'll see things like chromin modif chromatin modifiers, histone cell transferases, all there at the same time. And the reason we tend to think that way is because a lot of this is based on, on chip studies where you, all of these things cross-link at the promoter. And so our mind wants to assume that they're all there at the same time. But I want you to consider the possibility that you have two factors that are completely mutually exclusive. But if they're competing for the same space, when you look at the chip patterns, they're going to look identical and as if they're right on top of each other. So really what we want to do is to be able to study dynamics. And we want to do that at a meaningful timescale. And we know from in vivo studies, I mean, a lot of these events are happening on the order of seconds, which is hard, if not impossible, to, to analyze by many techniques, and, and in particular, cross-linking techniques. On top of that, when we look at chip patterns or DNA's footprints or gel shifts, we're looking at an ensemble measurement. We're essentially looking at the average. And so if we have multiple pathways that are, um, that are different, those are hard to resolve when you're looking at the mixture. Um, also, a lot of those will only look at very stable intermediates. So what we want to be able to do is look um, at very fast time scale, but also at single molecules. 
And so a number of years ago, uh, my lab teamed up with the lab of Jeff Gellis at Brandeis University. And Jeff is, has for decades been an expert on single molecule studies of bacterial transcription, but has also done some beautiful work on mRNA splicing with Melissa Moore and DNA replication with the Bell Lab at MIT. So we wanted to take his approach and apply it to our um, RNA polymerase II transcription system. The work I'm gonna tell you about today is from two fantastic scientists, a, a former graduate student in Marbeck who um, left recently and a postdoc, John Chiljian, who's doing some beautiful work um, on coactivators. And I won't mention, um, I won't show specific experiments, but this is a lot of work um, together with other folks in the lab, both in my lab and in Jeff's lab. So our system is actually derived from um, a system that we've been using, um, using immobilized DNA templates. And this is a system we borrowed from Steve Hahn and, and others have used it extensively. Um, it's a very simple ID. You take your DNA fragment that has your promoter and your UAS, you put a biotin on one end, and in the immobilized template assays, what we'll do is we'll put those on beads and pull down. We can do mass spec and, and other kinds of analysis. But here we're going to put a blue fluorophore on the end, and we're going to affix it to a microscope slide. So all these little spots that you see, each one is in an individual DNA template um, imaged in the blue channel. Now we're using turf microscopy, and what we'll do is we'll flow in yeast extract, and we've engineered the yeast to express some fusion proteins that can be labeled with either a red or green dye. So um, typically we're imaging two different transcription factors at a time, and we're in the process of trying to get that to three. Um, using this, this multicolor turf microscopy, we can then take movies and we can essentially watch the, in the computer, we can pick out the region where each DNA is sitting and then just follow each frame and look for the association of bindings. So here's a polymerase molecule showing up. Here's a TF2E molecule showing up on the same DNA. Um, all those individual frames can be digitized and we can look at um, no binding, binding, et cetera. So that's polymerase binding. And then a little bit later, you see TF2E show up. So what's nice about it, it's a single molecule assay, but on the other hand, we've got 300 or 400 DNA spots per slide, so we can also do some statistics. So we can take all those individual traces of binding, um, stack them up on each other, we basically um, form a binary, and everywhere we have binding, we'll put some color, and um, if there's no binding, it'll be white. And then we'll stack all of those DNAs up in these, um, what we call rastergrams. And you can see we order them by um, the time of arrival. And um, you can see that on any given DNA, we'll see binding, dissociation, binding, dissociation. Um, but we get this nice smooth curve, which can actually be mathematically converted to an association rate that you can see here. A critical, um, uh, critical control that we always have to do is also look off DNA because we do get some background binding and that's what the curve looks like for that. Um, so here in was doing an experiment where she's either doing it in the presence of an activator or the absence of an activator. And you can see that the polymerase binding is completely dependent on the activator. Um, I should also mention that all the experiments I'll show you today are done without NTPs. So we're looking at assembly, but we're not actually um, allowing the reaction to go on to transcribe. So I wanna start out um, showing you a few things um, that, that Zhang Chol has done looking at some coactivators. And it's a very simple experiment. We can measure the on and off rate stoichiometry, stoichiometry of um, the factors in the presence or the absence of the activator. And the first factor that he decided to look at was Saga. And um, here we got a very interesting result because we were expecting that saga recruitment to the DNA would be completely dependent on activator. But I think you can just see right off the bat when we look at the binding, um, in the absence of activator or in the presence of activator, it's actually quite simple. Um, there are some subtle differences in the duration time I'll mention in just a minute. So John Chul is also image switch sniff. And here you can see something quite different. So, so again, there is some binding to the DNA and I should say, um, I didn't show you the off DNA, but this is DNA specific. But in the presence of activator, you see the on rate is, is certainly increased. And then also we've been looking at mediator and mediator also shows a very strong increase in the presence of activator, but you'll also notice that the, the duration of each binding event tends to be much, much longer. So we see, you know, depending on the coactivator, we see effects on the on rate, we see effects on the off rate, or sometimes um, we see both. Now this is all on naked DNA, which of course is not the physiological template. So John Charles developed a, a beautiful system where we can actually on the same slide compare both naked and chromatin templates. And the way we do that, we actually use the same DNA and the same fluorophore, 
Um, but first we'll flow in the naked DNA templates and we'll map them in the computer by imaging. And then we'll flow in the second template. In this case, these are um, this, uh, the same template I showed you before, um, made up with um, recombinant histones and the ISY assembly system. So generally these have about three nucleosomes per DNA template. You might notice that the chromatinized templates tend to be brighter and that's because they're more compact and the fluorophore is actually closer to the slide surface in the turf field. So um, in this system, um, we, we see a, something quite different. And now the binding of saga is um, very strongly dependent on an activator. And in this experiment, um, we're imaging GAL4 and you can see the GAL4 binding is quite robust even on chromatin. And um, in the case of saga, we get a nice increase in binding. But if now Junctrel does the same experiment using GAL4 DNA binding domain only. So here's the VP16 activation domain. Here's the DNA binding domain only. The activator binds quite similarly, but you see that we don't get that beautiful beautiful recruitment of saga. So the system is really nicely placed where we can look at um, what happens, um, how these coactivators respond to activation domains. And I should mention, we we can also swap in different activation domains. So we've done GCN4 activation domain, um, RAP1 activation domain, and it'll be interesting to see how the different activation domains um, behave. So in this experiment, um, this is a two color experiment. And this is just to show you that we, we also see a nice strong activation dependent stimulation for switch sniff and mediator. And here you can see this little red line that represents the first binding of the GAL4 VP16 activator. And then green is the co-activator. And I think what you can see is that the, the binding of the co-activators um, follows on nicely after the activator binds. So again, that, that sort of recruitment in the sense that we're increasing the association rate. Okay, so that first section, um, you know, just gives you a flavor for what we can do. And this is really a work in progress. We have so many different experiments we'd like to do, um, but we can definitely distinguish when things are, when activators are increasing association versus dissociation rates. And in many cases, we do see that this dissociation rates are decreased and that we're actually stabilizing the dwell time of those factors. Um, of course, we want to look at what happens if we pre-acetylate nucleosomes, what's the effect of, of ATP and other um, nucleotide triphosphates. John Chol is asking questions about whether the, all the saga domains are always coming together or, or do they sometimes act independently. And then eventually what we'd really like to do is to actually image the nucleosomes themselves. So in the, in the second part of the talk, uh, I'll tell you some work from Inwa um, that she's done. This is published in Molecular Cell a few months ago, um, late last year. And here we were really coming from the context of the initiation complex. We wanted to ask about assembly of the general transcription factors on the Tata box. And I showed you already before that the polymerase binding in the system is highly dependent on the activator, but we had one surprise right off the bat. And that's when we looked at the individual traces, what Inwa um, immediately noticed is that we would see binding of the single polymerase, but then sometimes we would see a second polymerase, actually quite often we'd see a second polymerase and even a third polymerase. And once in a while, we'd even get four or five polymerases all sitting on the same DNA. And you might say, well, polymerase binds DNA. These are naked templates. Maybe you're just looking at nonspecific DNA binding, but we know that the binding is completely activator dependent. So we really didn't think it was nonspecific. We also have a ton of competitor DNA in the reaction. Um, and then of course you start thinking about other types of clustering. And in these days, of course, you have to consider things like condensates, et cetera. But really we thought um, the, the most likely explanation and the one that we still believe is true is that in fact, what's going on is that the polymerases are being tethered to the template via the activators. Now, remember on this template, we actually have five GAL4 UAS binding sites. And when we do the imaging of the activator, we know that most of these tend to be occupied at any given time. And so um, if each of those activators can, can um, bring in a mediator polymerase complex, you can get multiple polymerase sitting at the UAS or the enhancer, um, if you like, um, as well as the single one that we were expecting to see at the core promoter. So some things that, that agree with that, we, we never see more polymerases than um, there are GAL4 binding sites. So if this was a condensate, we might expect to see you know, much larger aggregate. Um, it's completely dependent on the activation domain, and, um, and we get essentially the identical result when mediate, for mediator when we image mediator. 
And so, um, so in my head, this experiment actually originally it was going to be a control, but it turned out to be again really um, the, the thing that that triggered our thinking on this process. We decided again to do a two template experiment, one where we first put down the full template with the UAS and the core promoter, and then a second negative control that would have only the UAS and image RNA polymerase. And amazingly, there was essentially no difference in the initial binding rate. You can see that the UAS recruits the polymerases just as well as the UAS plus promoter. And um, in the paper, you can see the details, but INWAS converted this to association rates. And if you think about it, if the polymerase can go to the UAS or independently can go to the core promoter, then when we compare the UAS plus promoter, um, that should be the combination of of those two different association rates, whereas the UAS only should only show us the, the association rate at the UAS. And what this experiment tells us, because these are identical, um, that tells us that the association rate to the UAS has to be much, much faster than any polymerases that could go directly to the promoter. And, and, and to me, that really suggests that what happens during activated transcription is the polymerase first goes to the UAS enhancer and then gets transferred onto the core promoter. Now, um, one thing that backs up that assertion is this, when we look at these curves, um, even though the association rate looks quite similar, when we look at the dwell times, you can see that the bars tend to be much longer when the promoter is present. And we can um, graph that in a quantitative way that you can see here, essentially, um, this is essentially a dissociation curve, a survival curve, um, telling you roughly what the half-lives of, of these different species are. And you can see on the UAS, we get essentially a a single species, um, which is dissociating on the order of say 10 seconds. And it's only when the core promoter is present that we get these long duration binding events that we, we believe and show data in the paper are, are due to pick assembly. So we think the picks are much more stable. And just to show that in a schematic way, um, what we've got here is the um, essentially two populations. We can measure one population of polymerase that associate um, very quickly coming off on the order of 10 seconds or so. Um, that's only dependent on the UAS. Whereas um, when we have the core promoter present, we get the longer lived population. And again, for various um, reasons that you can read about in the paper, we believe that those are due to pick assembly. So that was great. Um, again, we were really thinking about looking at pick assembly on the core promoter, but um, in the process we had generated nuclear extracts where we could co-image polymerase and TF2F or TF2E or TF2H. And, and those two color experiments, I'll just show you one example here for 2F and RNA polymerase. Um, the TF2F again binds beautifully. It only binds when polymerase is present. Um, and you can see, once again, we were seeing sometimes these multiple binding events where we would see two different labeled TF2Fs on the same DNA molecule. And what was interesting is the only time we would ever see multiple 2Fs was when there were multiple polymerases present here. Again, you can see the multiple polymerases. So, you know, that raised the question, could 2F actually be going to the UAS as well? We certainly know from, from many decades of biochemistry that 2F and polymerase can form a tight complex off of the DNA. And sure enough, we could see um, very nice recruitment binding association of TF2F to the UAS. Um, and it was essentially almost identical to promoter, tiny bit, tiny bit less. Um, and so that raises the question, well, what about other basal transcription factors? Um, I've already shown you polymerase going to the US. I just showed you TF2F. We did TF2E and we got the same result. Um, and, and now we should, to be honest, we're really starting to get nervous. Oh, you know, maybe we have a Tata box and we're actually assembling picks here on the US. Um, we finally got to TF2H and got the result that made us very confident that what we were looking at was for real. Um, here you see that TF2H behaves completely differently. So TF2H um, will not bind to the UAS above background. The H binding has a little bit higher background to the slide, so that's why the curve's a little bit higher than over here. But you can see that the, the DNA-specific binding is only um, observed when the core promoter is present. Um, another thing that, that um, helps us be confident in this model is we can look at the, the gap, the, the um, 
the, uh, the lag time between polymerase arrival and TF2H. And, you know, characteristically, it's on the order of, say, 10, 20 seconds. And that um, gives us a rough idea of what the time might be from polymerase first binding to transfer to the core promoter and assembly of the other factors. Um, you can even see it in, in, the, in the binding curves. You can see there's this lag time about 40, 50 seconds or so before you really start to see the H binding above the DNA. So the model that leads to um, incorporating all the data, and you can see uh, all the rest of the data in the paper, as well as the mathematical uh, formalisms. But what we're left to conclude is that polymerase comes in primarily at the enhancer, um, often, more often than not, with TF2F prebound, although sometimes F will come in afterwards. And we think that gets transferred to the core promoter. TF2E, um, very similar, we see quite good recruitment of TF2E to the UAS, but we also, in this case, see that a lot of E can go directly to the promoter, presumably after polymerase and F is transferred. What I like about this, um, this is really an interesting thing. Um, if you know anything about Pol1 and Pol3, you know that, that they're very, very similar to Pol2. They actually share many subunits and, and a lot of the basal factors are the same. And there actually are TF2E and TF2F homologs in the, um, in the pole one and pole three system, but they're not separate factors. They're actually integral subunits of those polymerases. And so that when, when we see this EF pre-assembling that to me raises the possibility that um, that's giving us one further connection between pole one, two and three systems. And then finally, after the transfer um, of that partial pick onto the core promoter, presumably when TF2D and TF2B are present, we're, we're now trying to look at those factors, then H can come in and complete the transcription complex. So, um, and just in the last two slides, um, what I wanna do is just tell you how I'm thinking about what this implies for transcription activation, because I think it has some really important and, and interesting corollaries. So now, instead of thinking of activated transcription as, as increasing the, the rate of each incremental um, step, adding one more general transcription factor. In my mind, um, what we're doing is we're kind of pre-assembling a pool of partial initiation complexes that have polymerase E and F tethered to the enhancer via the activators. And I don't show mediator here, but we, we presume mediator is present here as well. Um, why I like that idea is, is, as you probably know, when you look at transcription in vivo um, and you look at an individual promoter, it tends not to be monotonic where you get a transcript, say, every minute. You tend to get these bursts where you see in rapid succession a few different transcription complexes firing off and then a long duration rest period and then another burst of transcription. And I think this kind of model um, could help explain that. So if you imagine that T TF2D, TF2B can bind to the core promoter for some window of time. If you have these polymerases essentially lined up ready to go during that time window when, when TF2D is there, you can you know, feed a polymerase in, have it fire off quickly, feed in the next polymerase, have it fire off quickly. And that might be one thing that contributes to this bursting types of phenotypes that we see. And then um, another thing that I think is really interesting to think about is what this, um, how this relates to the in vivo imaging that a lot of groups have been doing recently, where when you image polymerase, you tend to see these clusters of polymerase. So instead of single molecules of polymerase, which are probably there in the background, you do see these, these clusters. And as you know, um, in many cases, those are interpreted to be some kind of condensate. And, and I'm not saying that doesn't exist. Of course, that's a certainly plausible mechanism. But um, if we can take an in, vivo, an in vitro system with only five Gal4 binding sites and we can get two to four polymerases associated at a time, you know, then you have to think, well, what if you had an enhancer in the mammalian cell where you've got 20 different activators um, in the extracts, we know the concentration of these factors are gonna be much, much higher. Um, would that be an, another way to get a cluster of, of factors um, in the microscope? That, that might look like some of the things we've seen in papers from, from Rick Young and Abraham Sisi and, and Tej, et cetera. So I went in, I looked at a couple of the papers imaging these, um, these clusters, and, and I think the numbers are consistent. So, so there are these things called super enhancers or what are interpreted to be super enhancers that probably are much larger, but the vast majority of these clusters um, tend to be on the order of 10 to 20 or so mediators. There's about a thousand clusters per cell um, in these two papers. One thing I think it's important to remember, the lifetimes of those clusters is short. It's only on the order of five to 10 seconds generally. 
um, another paper from the Pertzinides group looking at a specific locus, locus SOX2, um, they estimate about 15 polymerases, about 10 mediators for um, the 30 SOX2 activator molecules that are there. So I think this, this mechanism for clustering together polymerases also has to be considered. And I think it's likely that at least some of the things people are looking at in vivo um, may be related to this kind of phenomenon. So um, and in that second part, as I just told you, so we, we have a different way of thinking about activated transcription now. Um, you know, I, in my PhD thesis, I actually proposed this kind of sequential assembly model at the Tata box, but that was done in vitro with purified factors. Um, in our system, which is nuclear extract, so again, probably much closer to what's going on in vivo, we think we're, we're bringing a lot of factors to the UES having a localized concentration increase there that then can then rapidly transfer to the core promoter. Of course, we, we now have to think about a way to actually show that transfer and we're working on mechanisms to do that. Um, we have tons of things that we would love to do because I think the system is really powerful. Um, we, we theoretically, we can do three factor imaging. We can reuse the blue channel. There's other colors that we might be able to work in. FRET studies, I think, are going to be really powerful, certainly in the bacterial system. Jeff's lab has done some beautiful FRET studies using the same microscope um, setup. Um, we're going to continue our work on the co-activators, looking at chromatin remodeling, um, histone modifications, we're continuing to work on, on the basal factors. Um, TF2D is, is something I've been excited about since I was a graduate student, and we're looking at some of the dynamics of TBP versus TAFs. Um, I, I would love to have somebody come and look at bromodomain factor interactions with the plus nucleosome. And then, of course, we really want to look at elongation as well. And we've actually published our first paper in PNES in 2020. Um, where we imaged um, SPT5 and polymerase, and you can take a look at that, but there are many more things we, we can do as well. So um, that brings me to the final slide. I, already, I already mentioned all of this work is done um, with Jeff and uh, his right-hand man, Larry Friedman, who developed the Cosmos system. Um, the work I told you about today was from Inwa and Zhang Chul, but lots of contributions, Sarah, um, Nathan's our expert on making the nuclear extracts, Jung Chul back here. Um, I haven't had time to tell you about the other work we're doing um, from Deepash and Hermi and Gabrielle doing our, our work on CTD. That's also interesting. And maybe you'll hear from one of them in the future. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Steve. That was fantastic. Um, and there's already a number of questions. And I'll start with Jason Fan, who has his hand raised. Um, so I've just clicked allow to talk. So you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Jason. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, really cool talk. Um, I, I was uh, curious about like in terms of like the, <clears throat> the numbers and kinetics of the, the clusters. So, so, it, so I guess in your model, like, you know, you have, you know, a bunch of the uh, polymerases and mediators recruited to the promoters and they can fire off. Uh, but, you know, in, in those papers, I guess the clusters, I can't remember if they dissipate after five to 10 minutes or they stop um, transcriptional bursting. So how do you foresee like kind of like the end of this like bursting, like presumably like you, if, if there's a steady state of or steady supply of polymerase coming or is, is it just purely because it's running out of like these factors? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. I, you know, that I, I can only speculate. I mean, and, and that model is speculation. Um, as I mentioned, at least in the papers I read, the, the half-lives of those clusters in vivo tend to be short, five to 10 seconds. Um, you know, how you would dissipate, of course, if you if you fire off all those polymerases, that's one way to deplete it. But um, these things are going to be dynamic coming on and off all the time. And so, you know, you have to think about things like chromatin accessibility. You have to push the nucleosomes out of the way to get the activators and whatever they recruit in there. The nucleosomes are always ready to swoop back in if, um, if any of those dissociate. So all of those things probably contribute to, to the end of bursting. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and they've got another question from Karen Arndt, who again, I'll allow to talk. And just a reminder that if you don't get to ask your question, we're gonna have a coffee chat afterwards. And so there'll be plenty of opportunity for more questions there. Hey, Karen. Hi, Steve, that was a beautiful talk. It's a pretty simple question. You know, as you know, in yeast, the distance between the UAS and the Tata box um, is limited with respect to activation potential. So do you think that this transfer mechanism is going to be distance dependent or also potentially regulated by factors such as SIN4 that mm -hmm. when mutant allow 
more distant activation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I, I honestly, of course, I can't answer it. We're we're playing around with the distance between the U.S. and the core promoter to see what effects that have. But you know, as you as you know, in yeast, we're talking about a few hundred base pairs. Um, and, and enhancers in mammalian cells can be KB, 10, 100 KB away. And so there you'd really have to think in three dimensions. Um, I imagine there's got to be either some distance effect or some way to bring those things together. Um, the people doing the in vivo imaging are talking about some, I, I've heard the term a kissing model where you've got at the enhancer, you know, this cluster or condensate, if, if you like, um, and the core promoters might dip in. Um, one interesting thing that we do know from some work from Mike. Mike Levine is you can have an enhancer that can activate multiple core promoters. And, and so that tells you that um, whatever that introduction is probably is fairly transient and that you don't, the, the enhancer um, isn't fixed to one core promoter to the exclusion of other core promoters. So I think, I think the, the, the question is going to be really interesting to get at, you know, in our in, in vitro system, that may be difficult to do, that may have to be done in vivo. Is with your in vitro system, is it possible to look at um, transfer in trans between molecules? Like, is that yeah, yeah, we we we're certainly thinking along those lines. Um, yeah, we 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 can do things like tether. Um, we can take a linear molecule and we can tether the. We can put the core promoter on one end of the tether and the UAS on the other hand, and possibly do fret to look at the the crossover that way. We haven't done any of that yet, but it's going to be really interesting to look at. Um, and then we've got a question from Sheila Tevez, who says, great talk, and asks, do you also see 2F2A, B, and D pre-assembling at the activator site? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. We're just doing those now, Sheila. Um, preliminary data says maybe TF2B and TF2D can also um, assemble at the UAS. I mean, TF2D may be not so surprising because TF2D is fairly well documented as a target for, for activators. TF2B, um, maybe going there. This data is very, very new, so I don't want to make any claims, but of course we're going to look at that. And then Carlos Escalante asks, what is the trigger for the transfer of RNA polymerase from the UAS site to the, to the promoter? Yeah, I don't know if you need to invoke any trigger. Um, we've been thinking about it as just a lo localized increase in concentration. And, and like any chemical reaction, if you increase the local concentration, the odds of those two things hitting each other, uh, there could be some kind of trigger. You could imagine for long range, some kind of looping, and maybe this is where cohesins come in. Um, but in our system, I don't think we have to invoke a trigger. Yeah. And then David Arnosti asks, how would this model in interpret cooperativity of a TF on enhancers? On the face of it, this model would predict more additive effects. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so synergism is something we've we've been thinking about. Um, keep in mind that the activators um, are recruiting multiple factors. So so GAL4 VP16 can recruit, you know, TF2D GAL4 VP16 can re recruit switch sniff. Saga, um, there, there are ways to get synergism that are not based on equilibrium. There's a fantastic paper, oh gosh, who's the author? Um, there's, a, there's a fantastic review um, on what's called kinetic synergism um, that can give you those kinds of synergistic effects um, on top of the sort of additive um, effects that we might expect from our model, yeah. And then Alan Chung asks, um, says, fabulous talk. For chromatin templates, how well positioned are the nucleosomes, nucleosomes relative to the, to the UAS sites? Mm -hmm. Presumably some or all of those sites are nucleosome bound. Yeah, so, the, so the, based on the size of our, of our fragment um, and the number of nucleosomes we're getting, we think we've got three nucleosomes over, I think around 700 or 800 base pair of fragments. So we think it's probably covered. It's probably not a uniform population. Um, we expect once we put these things in the nuclear extract, the nucleosomes, there, there may be some sliding and moving. We're not using any kind of positioning sequence or anything like that. So it's probably fairly heterogeneous. We haven't mapped or forced the nucleosomes onto specific sites yet. And then there's a few questions kind of getting at the mechanism of transfer of polymerases from the UAS to the core promoter asking if this is kind of tracking along the DNA or some other 
other mechanism. Yeah, I think, you know, classically, um, the, the looping model has really been the one that I, th I think most folks would like to think about. Theoretically, you might think you could bind and then slide along the DNA. I think in the old literature, when people were doing the initial enhancer bashing and things like that, that's probably less likely than, again, these things are all floating around in three-dimensional space on very rapid timescales. I mean, that, I think for many of us, it's hard to imagine how fast these things move around. Um, but, it, but the in vivo imaging people are showing a single polymerase can shoot from one side to the nucleus to the other in a few seconds. So the idea that these things are floating around and will crash into each other with some frequency, I think is the most likely way through that kind of looping. Awesome. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. It's about one o'clock. So thank you again, Steve and Sam, for both of your fantastic seminars. Um, for everyone, if you want to stay for the coffee chat, just post in the chat and we'll upgrade you to panelist. Um, and then we can have a discussion um, over the next 30 minutes. For everyone else, thank you for attending and we hope to see you in two weeks.